Hello everyone, welcome to Raw Online. I am Dr. Aditi. I am a consultant in internal medicine working at Mehta Hospital, Chennai. And in this session, we are going to be discussing a few questions uh, from uh, the endocrine system as far as MRCP Part 1 examination is concerned. So, let's dive straight ahead. So, as I mentioned earlier, during the Q&A session, I will be trying to hopefully instill the right kind of approach, the most maybe time efficient approach as far as approaching these elaborate questions is concerned and we will navigate through a few important concepts and topics during this Q&A module. A whole bunch of high yield topics are going to be covered in the prep modules for each of these systems in the MRCP1 module. So, putting both these together, it will definitely be able to help you clear these examinations with ease. Uh, what I would suggest is for you to first attend the prep module and then to put yourself through the Q&A module so that you will actually be able to assess yourself as to whether your approach is helping you equally to get to the answer as quickly as I do during the discussions in the Q&A module. And then what I would like you to do is to actually take up the questions uh, there's another whole list of questions that we're going to be giving you in PDF format for each of these systems. So, following the prep module, take up the Q&A discussion module, attend the discussion with me. So, that you'll be able to have an idea of the approach, which is going to help you navigate these questions easily. And then you can try to solve a whole bunch of questions on your own. Then if you do have the time, allow yourself, put yourself through a lot more questions because Nothing makes it perfect as much as practice does. So, let's start off with the first question here. A 28 year old woman is uh, reviewed in the endocrine clinic. So, as with the previous Q&A modules, uh, how do we go ahead with approaching questions? We highlight or underline or make a note of all the important points from the question and then read from the case rather and then read the most important part of the question which is the question per se the last statement in this elaborate case history and then you review all your points from the questions perspective so here we have a young woman who's losing weight suffering from neck pain and palpitation she is 10 weeks pregnant so we have a young pregnant woman in her first trimester of pregnancy here thankfully they've given us the diagnosis itself so she's been diagnosed with graves disease that's why i said do not jump to conclusion as you read each and every point. Don't try to break your head over the diagnosis. Just keep underlining the important points and move forward, uh, run through the question. And towards the end, you can put all these important points from the perspective of the question. That will be really time efficient also and it will avoid a lot of confusion. So, here they have given you a bunch of investigations. Uh, hemoglobin is slightly low. Other than that, what are we able to see here? We are able to see that the TSH is significantly suppressed and the free T4 is elevated. So, this picture here is again consistent with the diagnosis of thyrotoxicosis. So, when you look at TSH and free T4 abnormalities, always remember both will move in the opposite direction in primary abnormalities. What do I mean? So, if free T4 is low and you look at the TSH, TSH is high. Here you are looking at primary hypothyroidism. Similarly, if the free T4 is high and the TSH is low, just like what happened in this case, then you are dealing with the primary hyperthyroidism. If on the contrary, your free T4 is low, if it is primary hypothyroidism, you expect your TSH to be high, right? But that does not happen. The TSH is inappropriately normal or at times it may even be low. In this case, you will consider a secondary hypothyroidism. So, this patient has TSH deficiency which could be isolated or as a part of panhypopituitarism. Similarly, uh, when free T4 is high, you expect the TSH to be suppressed if it is primary hyperthyroidism. But instead, if your TSH is also going to be increased or if it is not suppressed, let us say it is inappropriately normal and not suppressed. This picture points towards a secondary hyperthyroidism. So, there is excess of TSH from the pituitary. So, you are looking at a TSH secreting adenoma. Remember that in all these conditions, clinically the patient will be 
hypothyroid be it primary or secondary hypothyroidism and uh, similarly be it whether the patient is having a primary hyperthyroidism or whether the thyrotoxicosis is because of a TSH secreting adenoma clinically the patient is going to have features of hyperthyroidism it is good to keep in mind that suppose the patient has a hypothyroid phenotype but the biochemical features look like this TSH is inappropriately normal or high and free T4 is also high this picture points towards TSH resistance towards thyroid hormone resistance resistance to thyroid hormone not TSH this points towards resistance to thyroid hormone therefore because the the T4 receptor is not working well there is resistance to the action of the thyroxine hormone at the level of periphery that is number one that is why although uh, the thyroid hormone levels are adequate the patient is going to have features of hypothyroidism not only that the same T4 receptors which are required for negative feedback that is again knocked off right because of that the TSH levels also keep increasing they are not suppressed so this picture but with a hypothyroid phenotype you should think of resistance to thyroid hormone the same picture with a hyperthyroid phenotype think of a TSH secreting adenoma now uh, using this case history I have tried to give you a rough approach to thyroid abnormalities but here that is not the question they have described a pregnant female in her first trimester with Graves disease and they are asking for the most appropriate intervention now uh, Graves disease can be managed by antithyroid drugs, radioiodine therapy and surgery. But in the first trimester of pregnancy, what is indicated antithyroid drugs is what is the treatment of choice. Amongst the antithyroid drugs, generally methimazole or carbimazole is going to be the drug of choice for most situations. There is only three exceptions to this rule where you are you will be opting for propylthiouracil over methimazole so what are these three indications where propylthiouracil rules number one first trimester of pregnancy because in the first trimester methimazole and carbimazole have been associated with teratogenic effects number two thyroid storm here again propylthiouracil has a slight edge over methimazole carbimazole because in addition to its antithyroid effects, it also inhibits peripheral conversion of T4 to T3. So, it is very helpful in thyroid storm. And what is the third indication? Most importantly, in any patient who has a contraindication to methimazole, carbimazole or any patient who is intolerant or allergic to methimazole, carbimazole, we use propylthiourazole. In no other situation do we prefer propylthiourazole over methimazole and carbimazole. So, here the moment you know this is a patient with Graves disease in the first trimester, you automatically know the treatment of choice is going to be propylthiouracil. Moving on to the next question, you have an obese 53-year-old uh, woman who presents with a myocardial infarction. Her mother has type 2 diabetes. Her cholesterol is 5.1 millimole per liter. Current medications include metformin, ramipril, aspirin. There is evidence of left ventricular failure. Recent HbA1c was measured at 64 millimole per mole and which one of the following interventions is most likely to prolong her survival. So, very simple, you have been described a patient with diabetes who has had a myocardial infarction and there is evidence of left ventricular failure. So, in this kind of an individual, amongst these, which drug is associated with improved survival? For this, you should know what are the drugs with proven ASCVD benefits? So, what are the drugs as far as the anti-diabetic agents are concerned which significantly alter MACE? What is MACE? Major adverse cardiovascular events. So, which drugs cause a significant reduction in MACE? Similarly, which are the drugs which significantly reduce the occurrence of heart failure in a diabetic patient this is what we should know so when we look at maze there are two group of agents here sglt2 inhibitors as well as glp1 receptor agonists these two groups of drugs are fairly beneficial when it comes to reduction of maze 
when you look at heart failure it is going to be sglt2 inhibitor so amongst these drugs let us see glycoside is a sulfonyl urea saxagliptin is a dpp4 inhibitor empagliflozin is a sglt2 inhibitor pioglitazone is a thiazolindione and a carbose is a alpha glucosidase inhibitor so amongst these groups of drugs which is a group that i said was helpful in reducing uh, cardiac events and in prolonging survival it is sglt2 inhibitor so here the right option is going to be empagliflozin this is why uh, the most recent guidelines state that even irrespective of previous metformin use in patients with an atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease or a ckd or a heart failure the first line of choice itself is going to be drugs with proven cardiac benefit like sglt2 inhibitors or glp1 receptor agonists now next question we have a 44 year old woman with newly diagnosed type 2 diabetes she reports increased sweating and swelling of hands and feet to the point she is no longer wearing her wedding ring so always remember in these mrcp questions whenever they say this patient is unable to wear a ring or the patient is unable to fit into slippers suddenly they find that they are outgrowing their uh, slippers so this kind of enlargement of the extremities soft tissue uh, swelling in the extremities uh, this should automatically point towards a diagnosis of acromegaly acromegaly is a syndrome characterized by secretion of excess of growth hormone now she complains that her sleep quality is poor and her husband re reports that she does snore often and she does stop breathing so there is evidence of acromegaly there is also evidence of obstructive sleep apnea uh, and they have made it easy for us they have said there is a diagnosis of acromegaly and associated insulin resistance in patients with hyperglycemia and suspected acromegaly which of the following tests will confirm the diagnosis of acromegaly now in uh, endocrine uh, questions particularly you are going to have these um, elaborate case scenarios for some like how they've done here they may make our job easier in giving you the diagnosis in some other patients they may completely omit this line and they may just tell you which would confirm the diagnosis in this patient so in such instances you need to arrive at a diagnosis at the end of your case as to what we are dealing with so let us say let us take this case here here we are dealing with acromegaly right in acromegaly the moment you get to the diagnosis read the question carefully particularly when we are dealing with an endo case because these syndromes have specific screening tests and they have specific confirmatory tests for instance when you take acromegaly this is a syndrome of growth hormone excess now always remember growth hormones actions are going to be exact opposite of insulin okay and earlier i have told this again during my endocrine lectures that whenever in endocrinology you are going to check for a hormone deficiency you are going to do a stimulatory test you are going to stimulate it maximum and that is the point where you expect the hormone to rise to its maximum level right but even with such stimulation if the levels are low then deficiency is confirmed similarly to demonstrate any hormone excess you are going to make use of suppression test for instance take cushing syndrome you do a dexamethasone suppression test to document excess of cortisol this is because again to demonstrate excess you need to make sure the hormone is suppressed it is at its lowest level when you want to measure it but even at that point if it is high then a hormone excess syndrome is confirmed so remember that so acromegaly as i said earlier this is a syndrome of growth hormone excess right so here screening is done with a molecule which is basically like the helper molecule for growth hormone growth hormone drives all of its actions through this molecule so you're going to screen patients for acromegaly by checking for insulin like growth factor 1 level so this test is very relevant to acromegaly for screening but that is not the question the question is to confirm the diagnosis for confirming the diagnosis as i mentioned generally in endocrinology excess you do a suppression test and i 
what did I just say? Growth hormones action is opposite to that of insulin. Right. So, what does growth hormone do? Insulin tries to decrease the blood glucose level. Growth hormone tries to increase the blood glucose level. So, for instance, if the blood glucose level drops, we would have learnt this even in hypoglycemia. One of the first line defense mechanisms defense mechanisms to occur in hypoglycemia following a drop in insulin secretion is increase in counter regulatory hormones like growth hormone and glucagon. So, we know that with hypoglycemia growth hormone is stimulated to be released but with hyperglycemia growth hormone is suppressed because growth hormone tries to increase the level of blood glucose unlike insulin any increase in blood glucose will automatically suppress the growth hormone. So, so, what do you do? You do something called a glucose tolerance test. So, in a glucose tolerance test, what happens? You give the patient a glucose load and then what you do is basically check the growth hormone level. Now, when you give the glucose load because blood glucose levels increase with the glucose load that is supposed to suppress the growth hormone. But even with an oral glucose load if the growth hormone is not going to be suppressed if it is elevated then that documents growth hormone excess. So, here the right answer is going to be glucose tolerance test and growth hormone levels. This is what you do. Insulin tolerance test and growth hormone level this is the opposite of this. So, this is you are trying to demonstrate growth hormone deficiency. You give insulin, create hypoglycemia. Once you create hypoglycemia, what happens? This decrease in glucose is going to stimulate growth hormone. So, insulin tolerance test is used to confirm growth hormone deficiency whereas glucose tolerance test is used to demonstrate growth hormone excess. So, remember G for G, glucose tolerance test, lots of G. So, one in glucose, one in GH. So, your, this is associated with growth hormone excess. This is used to document growth hormone excess. Random growth hormone level is not useful. A random level, remember in endocrinology of any hormone is not going to be very useful. Urinary cortisol level again is something that is used as a screening test in Cushing syndrome. That to a 24 hour urinary cortisol level. So, here the uh, right answer is glucose tolerance test and GH level. Now, next question, we have a young male who comes to the endocrinology department for review. He is as tall as his peers, but parents are concerned because he does not appear to have entered puberty. There is a lack of sense of smell, although this was thought to have had at least in part to be related to a rugby injury a few years earlier. So, whenever you have these features of hypogonadism, okay, so here as you read through, you are able to read that the testis is small, there is decreased facial and body hair. So, there is evidence of hypogonadism. So, the next question is whether this is hypergonadotrophic hypogonadism or hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism. What do I mean by that? In hypergonadotropic hypogonadism, the, what are the gonadotropins? The FSH and LH. So, they are increased. Increased because there is no negative suppression from the gonadal hormones like estradiol or testosterone. Therefore, if FSH and LH, the gonadotropins are increased, that means here the problem is in the gonads. So, usually this picture, uh, hypergonadotropic hypogonadism is seen in patients with primary gonadal failure. So, all these syndromes with primary gonadal failure, like for instance, you take Kleinfelter syndrome, there is going to be small testes because of the gonadal failure, patients are going to have hypergonadotropic hypogonadism. So, that is where you see hypergonadotropic hypogonadism. Now, you take hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, the gonadotropins as the name itself suggests they are going to be reduced. So, when FSH and LH is reduced, that means the problem may be either in the pituitary or in the hypothalamus. Now, uh, congenital adrenal hyperplasia in males does not present in this manner. If it is females, it is usually something that presents with virilization and hirsutism. If it is males, it presents with precocious puberty. So, this is not what we are dealing with here. There is no diselectylitemia. So, we are not dealing with congenital adrenal hyperplasia here. When you take constitutional delayed puberty, everything else is normal. Only the puberty is delayed. So, again, that does not seem to be the case here. 
because the patient does have small testes this lack of sense of smell seems to be important and it's not fitting in with a constitutional delayed puberty i've already told you in kleinfelter syndrome there is going to be hypergonadotropic hypogonadism um, in kleinfelter syndrome again uh, these males can be really tall so here they have not mentioned the fsh and lh so could it be this it could be kalman syndrome is a hypogonadotropic hypogonadism here because the hormones have not been mentioned it could be this as well could it be testicular feminization syndrome uh, what is the phenotype in testicular feminization syndrome here basically there is uh, either complete or partial androgen insensitivity when we say there is testicular feminization syndrome that means there is complete androgen insensitivity because of that the phenotype is actually going to be a female so usually you have females who come to you young females who come to you because they have not uh, attained menarche uh actually they would have developed all secondary sexual characteristics but they may not have developed uh, they may not have attained menarche that is usually how uh, patients with tfs present here because we are dealing with a male this is completely ruled out so we have narrowed it down to two possibilities kalman's and kleinfelter syndrome if in this question if they had mentioned fsh and lh that would have been very helpful right because if fsh and lh were high then we would notice kleinfelters and if fsh and lh is low we would notice kalman's but here that is not mentioned but instead they have given us one other important clue which is standing out in this question so in this case about sexual characteristics and basically about pubertal features why should they specifically commit to a lack of sense of smell so remember whenever this sense of smell is heightened in a case like this uh, a young male uh, with some uh, uh, you know uh, features of hypogonadism then that points towards kalman syndrome so this is a kalman syndrome is a hypothalamic cause of hypogonadism so here because they have mentioned that there is a lack of smell in this patient with the features of hypogonadism we are going to go with kalman syndrome so here the right answer is kalman syndrome so we have an elderly lady who was referred to the clinic after an incidental finding of hypercalcemia she did not have any symptoms she had a history of hypothyroidism for which she took levothyroxine now in which of these following conditions would you find hypercalcemia so basically we need to know whether a syndrome is going to be associated with hypo or hypercalcemia so this is not a concept based question this is either you know or you don't know kind of a question d jot syndrome is associated with hypocalcemia polyglandular syndrome type 1 is associated with hypoparathyroidism and hence hypocalcemia secondly hyperparathyroidism although the name says hyperparathyroidism see here this is secondary so usually this occurs in a condition which decreases calcium for instance take vitamin deficiency in vitamin d deficiency what happens calcium levels drop and this stimulates the parathyroid gland to release parathormone which struggles to maintain this calcium level normal so remember in all cases of secondary hyperparathyroidism pth levels will be high but it is usually associated with a normal or a low normal calcium level and never with a hypercalcemia in tumor lysis syndrome again it is associated with low calcium so calcium is low everything else potassium is high phosphorus is high uric acid is high everything else is high so let's take tertiary hyperparathyroidism tertiary and primary hyperparathyroidism both these are the ones which are associated with hypercalcemia now in primary hyperparathyroidism the defect is in the parathyroid gland itself there is an increased secretion of pth therefore we all know that pth drives increase in serum calcium so at the bone there is increased calcium resorption in the kidney there is increased calcium resorption and decreased calcium excretion not only that there is increased uh, phosphorus loss in the kidney which results in decrease in the serum phosphorus because there is decreased phosphorus reabsorption and finally you find that by acting on the kidney through vitamin d right it basically increases the activity of 1 alpha hydroxylase thereby increasing active vitamin d and through vitamin d it promotes calcium reabsorption from the gut as well so in primary hyperparathyroidism you have 
increase in serum calcium increase in pth and a decrease in serum phosphorus now you take tertiary hyperparathyroidism so usually tertiary hyperparathyroidism occurs in the background of ckd so ckd is one of the most common causes of secondary hyperparathyroidism where there are multiple uh, stimuli for a pth secretion so not only in ckd the active vitamin d is reduced and hence calcium is reduced which stimulates parathormone also because the kidneys are not functioning well there is decreased excretion of phosphorus and hence increase in the serum phosphorus that also stimulates uh, parathyroid gland to release parathormone so in long standing ckd with secondary hyperparathyroidism what happens because of this chronic stimulus by these triggers there may be selected clones of cells which develop autonomy now this parathyroid nodule which is autonomous this contributes to this works like a parathyroid adenoma which develops in the background of a long standing secondary hyperparathyroidism and this starts to secrete excess pth independent of these stimuli that is called tertiary hyperparathyroidism so remember any ckd patient usually the calcium is going to be normal or low normal because it is secondary hyperparathyroidism that is seen in ckd the moment you have high calcium in a patient with ckd you will know that we are dealing with tertiary hyperparathyroidism now next uh, question uh, we are asked by a gp to review a young girl who presents with primary amenorrhea now on examination she has minimal pubic hair but normal breast development examination reveals a blind ended vagina biochemistry reveals an increased luteinizing hormone level normal follicular stimulating hormone level and um, raised estradiol and testosterone levels now in this a few things it is important to take in you have an 18 year old girl um, who basically comes with uh, although she has normal breast development the body hair is very scanty so whenever you have this picture remember normal breast development in a young female with scant uh, body hair usually these patients have amenorrhea and this blind vagina this picture automatically we should think of testicular feminization syndrome so here we are talking about complete androgen insensitivity syndrome because the androgen receptors are defective it is very very important for development of um, secondary sexual characteristics and for the external genitalia because both these are knocked off these patients although genotype is going to be 46 xy they are phenotype because the external genitalia development depends on these androgen receptors and because the receptors are defective the genitalia has not we all know that the female genitalia is the genitalia by default when the uh, during embryogenesis subsequently what happens the androgens act at the receptors and and uh, promote development of a male genitalia so because the receptors are defective these patients continue to have a female external genitalia resulting in a female phenotype now these patients because of the same reason because these androgen receptors are not going to be sensitive they are going to have scanty body hair so you will have a very beautiful looking female patient with normal breast development but with hardly any pubic hair amenorrhea blind vagina this picture points towards a testicular feminization syndrome or a complete androgen insensitivity syndrome so here we are dealing with complete androgen insensitivity syndrome this is not polycystic ovarian syndrome in polycystic ovarian syndrome it is usually associated with although this kind of a ratio there is an increased lh fsh ratio and testosterone levels may be increased patients generally do not present with primary amenorrhea this primary amenorrhea scant pubic hair because on the contrary in polycystic ovarian syndrome all this increase in testosterone levels would have contributed to hirsutism that is not present here so we are not dealing with polycystic ovarian syndrome is this turner syndrome there is no mention of the patient having 
short stature, webbed neck, other uh, typical phenotypic features are just of Turner syndrome, which is 45X. So, so here again, uh, we are not dealing with Turner syndrome. Remember, in patients with Turner syndrome, they have primary gonadal failure, if at all. Therefore, you can have an elevated LH and FSH level, but estradiol level will usually be decreased. Is it Asherman syndrome? No, Asherman syndrome in this patient is not relevant. Usually patients with Asherman syndrome develop secondary amenorrhea. What is Asherman syndrome? Usually due to instrumentation, there is going to be inside the uterus, there is going to be a lot of adhesions and synechy and that results in secondary amenorrhea. Is it going to be, this is not Kilman syndrome, this is Kalman syndrome. We saw earlier that Kalman syndrome causes a hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. Therefore, here in this patient, a normal FSH and an elevated LH almost rules out any cause of hypogonotropic hypogonadism. So, we are not dealing with that either. So, here the answer is complete androgen insensitivity syndrome.